Here we go. Now, this evening's talk, I th- decided that I would try and think of something to say before I came in here. But I think I arrived about 5.30, and as soon as, uh, before I even walked in the door, that was it. I got caught taking photos with the visiting Thais, talking with our visiting um, Singaporeans, talking with the people who live here all the time, you should know better. <laughs> I hardly had time to get to the toilet. Oh, it's a very difficult life as a monk. (laughs) In fact, I was thinking just how hard a monk works because after the last talk last week, and I had a quick rest over there and then got up early to fly to Sydney to give some war talks over there on Saturday, Sunday and Monday. Oh, I work really hard. So how can you do that? because this is what we all need to know, actually, how we can cope with the stress of modern monk life, or modern life. (laughs) But also, to be wise, to be happy, to be effective. And that was interesting, because tonight's talk is about the, how we actually equate real happiness, real happiness with what we call mental energy, mind energy, not talking about physical energy, mind energy and happiness. This is a deep teaching of the Buddha because very often those of you who've read some of the original teachings of the Buddha from the suttas would have read again and again the Buddha saying that the only thing he teaches is suffering and the end of suffering. In other words, suffering and happiness. That was the whole thrust of the Dharma taught by the Buddha about the understanding what suffering is, understanding what happiness is. And I'm now going to teach you the secret of real happiness. And also, not just real happiness in the sense of just enjoying yourself, but how real happiness also, it coincides with the energy which can serve others. So you can do your duties in this world. I'm mentioning this because, again, in that trip to Sydney, there's actually somebody from Sydney who was at my talks in Sydney here this evening, and they will know the place where I give these talks in Sydney in a little meditation Buddhist center called Bodhi Kusuma. It's in the suburb of Chippendale, which is just next door to Redfern, in one of the inner suburbs, and it is a rough area. In fact, two doors down from the Buddhist centre is a brothel. (laughs) And of course, being in such close proximity, I made some comparisons. (laughs) In fact, I made the comparison because many of you have heard me say this before. It was actually the subject of, of the presentation I gave at the Third Global Conference in Singapore. My presentation was meditation, a bliss better than sex. So really, I was uh, pinching the customers from the block for the next two doors over. <laughs> but I say, this is a much better bliss in this meditation center you can get next door. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> More than that, that sometimes, <laughs> as you would know there, that house of ill repute, the only reason you would know it was there was because they got hearts all over the front. And I thought, actually, the Buddhist temple, we should have bigger hearts. <laughs> because we're much more into compassion. That's real love. And have you ever noticed the heart symbol is a Bodhi leaf upside down? <laughs> Look at a Bodhi leaf. Perhaps this is what we really mean by the heart. The Bodhi, the wisdom, is the real the heart of compassion. Now, what do you actually really mean by that? Just the happiness, actually, you get, the joy you can get from the practice of Buddhism. Because the Buddha was talking about lessening suffering, increasing happiness, you don't really understand what and how we get this inner happiness, the real happiness. One of the themes which I've been teaching my monks down at Serpentine for the past three months is like an insight which comes from your meditation, which actually 
uh, is a powerful insight because it informs many of the things which you do in life and gives you an understanding of how to live the life of a lay person or a monk, a husband or a wife, a worker or whatever. And it's the understanding that mental energy is happiness. Mental energy. It's something which my teacher said, Ajahn Chah said many, many times, which again was very hard to understand until you can experience by putting this into practice and experimenting with it. He said, if you're going to have a fit body, you have to exercise. You have to do something with this body. If you just leave this body sitting still, it gets quite sick. The body's health depends upon movement, doing, exercising. But he said, the mind's health is completely opposite. You get mental health by being still, as peaceful as you possibly can. That's where you get the mental health, agility and power. Completely opposite. Sometimes what we are taught, or maybe you brought into the fact that the more you think, the smarter you will be or the happier you will be. But those of you who have thought a lot would have also taken much aspirin or paracetamol. That's what happens when you think too much. And those who think too much, they know very little. We think, but we don't see. Because most of those thoughts are the words which describe the world, but they're not the world themselves. They confuse us into misinterpreting what's really going on. The menu is not the meal. The map is not the destination. The signpost is not the object which is pointing to. Your thoughts are not the real thing. But more than that, the more you think, the more you use up your mental energy. You get weak until eventually you get completely depressed. People who get depressed simply think too much. Now, when you understand that mental energy is happiness, how do you actually develop mental energy? You don't develop mental energy by thinking, by using the mind, by working it, by worrying. That's not the way to actually develop mental energy. In fact, that uses up all of your mental energy, which is why that so many people suffer depression these days, simply because their poor old brain is tired, worn out, as, as dry of juice as a used tea bag. Yeah. Now that's what most people's brains are like, isn't it? When you, you just squeeze, squeeze everything you possibly could out of it today and you've got hardly anything left. So how can you revive yourself? Now I've been, have had my tea bag squeezed today. Squeezed by I don't know how many people in the monastery, by the monks, by the Singaporeans, by the Thais, by you guys staying here, and now you're squeezing me again. <laughs> but it does not matter because I know how to regenerate my tea bag, how to, how to build up the mental energy inside. And that mental energy comes from being still. What actually happens, if you want to know the underlying power of this, that your life has energy. Call it like the life force, if you like. That's actually the Buddha talked about that, the life force. You've got a certain amount of life force. Where does that go? How do you use the energy of your life? You use too much in thinking, worrying, controlling, planning, making, changing. Because we use it all in that area, We've got not enough left for the mind. It's always in the reacting, doing, controlling. Of course, that is what we have to do a lot of the time. But we don't have to do that all the time. Can't we every now and again put down our burden, put down trying to change the world, put down, down trying to change our husband, <laughs> or our wife, or our kids, or our monks, or whatever. And can't we learn just for a few moments to allow things to be? What does that mean by letting things be? 
by allowing the door of your heart to open to whatever it's experiencing, by being at peace with things, by just uh, uh, being passively aware, being a silent watcher. What does that mean? It means not doing anything. It means resting the mind. Most of the time we have to react, but we react too much. Because we do that all day and sometimes all night, we haven't got any brain juice left. We're dry. But if you just stop for a few moments, in that stopping, in that putting down the reacting, in that letting go of the levers of your mind which you control yourself and the world, what actually happens then is the energies of your being, they don't go into changing the world. They don't go into controlling and making things any different. You really are allowing the way things are just to be for a few moments. And in allowing the way things are just to be, then things start to change. They start to change because your energies are now going in to the pure knowing. A word which I use today, which I've been using in the range retreat for the first time, not unconditional loving kindness, but unconditional mindfulness. It's a new word I've just coined. Unconditional mindfulness. You heard it here first. <laughs> what do you mean by unconditional mindfulness? It means like being aware of something without demanding it be different, not sort of thinking that I'll be mindful of this but not be mindful of that. Just whatever you're aware of, opening your mindfulness completely to that as it is, without any complaints. Unconditional mindfulness. If it really is unconditional mindfulness, whatever you're watching means you have no business to do. You don't have to react to it, you don't have to do anything about it, you don't have to change it, hold on to it, alter it in any which way. In the same way, unconditional loving kindness accepts the person who you love as they are. Unconditional mindfulness sees whatever's there as it is, without reacting to it. If you could try unconditional mindfulness for a little while, you will find that things change by themselves because what happens instead of the energy of your being being wasted in doing this, getting there, controlling, wanting this, wanting me to be different, I'm not good enough, I've got to do this, this meditation's not good enough, I've got to do something else, this talk's not good enough, I'm going to go next door, maybe there's a better talk in a Buddhist centre down the road. We should be watching the TV tonight, you know there's something really good on the TV tonight, stop t thinking like that. Instead of complaining, just shh, be quiet for a while. Have unconditional mindfulness. Then the energies at last start being able to flow into your mind instead of into the doing, the controller. When the energies start flowing into your awareness, into the knowing, into the mind, into just pure consciousness, whatever you wish to call it, because that is becoming a recipient of your energy, it does become energized. Your mind starts to become bright. It starts to become so bright that you start to see much deeper into things and also what you see becomes happier. You have energy and you also start to have happiness as well. It's one thing which I have noticed just in my life as a monk, as you meditate more and more, you notice the how the energy of the mind comes from stopping doing things. And energy means happiness, means more depth in your perception, more richness in your life. I notice this, I told this in Sydney, I notice this First, probably, in my first meditation retreat in Cambridge over 35 years ago, I think. In that meditation retreat, it was held in a boarding house. You know, boarding houses in England 
in, I think, 1970, were most noted for how disgusting was the food. Because people, they didn't know how to cook. It was all boiled. Boiled potatoes. Boiled peas. And even as if there was anything else to eat, it was absolutely you know, the, the least possible work done to make it, you know, make it so delicious. Boarding house food was terrible. But at this first retreat which I went to, I thought that we must have been so lucky, so fortunate. We must have hit on one of the boarding house chefs who could know how to cook. But the food was delicious. You know why? After a while I realized it wasn't the cooks. It was me. When you start to become peaceful, when the mind starts to become energized, when all the energy of your being, instead of complaining, because you're taught to meditate and shh, be quiet, and stop doing things, the mind became energized and what I was tasting, I could taste more out of that boiled potato than I could normally do. You didn't need to have gravy or sauces. When the mind was uh, in, uh, alive, when the mind was energized, it could taste things in a potato that no other person could ever taste. <laughs> That's just in a potato. Those of you who've been on our meditation retreats, have you ever noticed that on meditation retreats, the food always tastes more delicious than outside? Why is that? And it's not the cooks. The, re <laughs> the reason why it f tastes more delicious is because of you. Your senses on a retreat are opened out. You've got energy. What you taste, what you see, what you hear, because your mind is clear, you can take more in. Which is why. If any of you are going out to dinner after this talk, you will find you'll get much more out of the dinner if you meditate, listen to or talk here. So if you ever go into a five-star restaurant, please make sure you come to the Buddhist Society first to get your money's worth. <laughs> and it's true. Because when the mind gets energized, what you taste is more delicious. You try that out. If you've been working really hard and you're tired, and you've got no energy in your mind, whatever you eat, it's dull. If people learn how to meditate and actually put energy into their mind so they can really appreciate the food, there'll be far less divorces in this world. <laughs> when you appreciate your wife's food, oh, you're such a good cook, wife. Oh, what you say do is so, so delicious. It's not that the food is not delicious, it's your mind is not open to the taste because it's tired. You can understand what happens when the mind gets very, very tired. It gets into this spiral of depression. Something goes wrong in your life and you feel sort of uh, a bit down. And people try to think themselves out of that depression. They struggle with depression. Because they struggle with depression, what little energy they have is used up in the struggle, in the fight. And of course they have less energy which makes them more dull, more depressed. They get in this spiral of deeper and deeper depression. The more they fight, the deeper they go. Which is why, as a monk, when people are depressed, they say, what's wrong with being depressed? Enjoy your depression. Depression, the door of my heart is open to you. Come on, let's see how depressed we can get. <laughs> now when you do that, <laughs> of course, because you're not fighting, you're accepting you'll find the depression gets less and less because you're not wasting the energies which you have in fighting. The energies of your being have a chance to flow into just knowing. The knowing brightens up. You see more, you see deeper and the greyness of life starts to disappear. It's not that the world is depressing. It's just the way one is looking with low energy. That's why the world is depressing. It's not the world. It's not your life. It's not your husband. It's you. This is why once you get into this idea of learning how to 
allow the mind to rest from time to time. Allowing the mind not to, what by resting, I mean not to do things, stop controlling, stop forcing, stop running. Take your hands off the steering wheel, the feet off the pedals of your life and just let go, relax, rest, don't do anything, be at peace. If you could do that just a little bit every day, you'll find the energies of your mind start to increase. As they increase, not only do you see deeper, do you hear deeper, you don't miss so much in life, you find you get happy as well. You get joyful. Those of you who are coming to see my monastery on Sunday, those of you who are going to see Dhammasara on Saturday, why do you go to such places? Why do you come here? A lot of times it's to see a happy monk. That's all. It's nice being around happy people. Tell for being around grumpy, grim, <laughs> so people never smile. Even just when I was giving a, the meditation, I asked you to smile after, uh, at the end of the talk. How many of you actually smiled, you grumpy lot? <laughs> That's better. Now, do you can see what I mean by energy? The mind starts to get a bit more energized and more happy. And when it gets energized and happy, you go out of this place energized and happy. Isn't that the case? If you really are grumpy, I've been telling people a joke. I heard this in Sydney. Someone told me this in Sydney. So this will make you laugh. I really have to try so hard to make people happy. If this meditation doesn't work, I'll tell them jokes. There was two Australians. They were lost in the desert. They'd been crawling around there for days. They were so hungry, so thirsty. They were close to death and almost deranged by the heat of the sun. When one of them looked ahead and saw a sausage tree. He said, look. <laughs> so look at that sausage tree. And the other guy said, what, you're mad? There's no such thing as a sausage tree. Yes, there is. It's there in front of me. And he walked toward, he, not walked, he crawled towards the sausage tree. And when he got within five meters of the sausage tree, he could see there was a saveloy hanging down off that branch. There was a pork sausage off of that branch. <laughs> As soon as he got within five meters, there was a hail of bullets. He got, got almost shot to pieces. And as he crawled away to tell his friend, he said, I was wrong. It wasn't a sausage tree. It was a ham bush. A ham bush. <laughs> At least it got you smiling anyway. <laughs> anyway, someone told me that in Sydney when I was over there. <laughs> anyway, you can actually see, if you laugh, don't you get energized? Don't you feel you can do things? Isn't your mind a bit clearer, a bit sharper? Because what actually happens? Happiness is mental energy. Mental energy is happiness. And one of our problems in life, because we do so much, we're working so hard, so much is demanded of us just to survive, that many of us lose our energies we get depressed. Sometimes not into the depression where you have clinical depression. We get so depressed, we cannot appreciate life. We cannot appreciate the food we eat. We cannot appreciate the people we live with. We cannot appreciate anything. That's why we get grumpy. We've just lost the taste of life. Because our senses are just dull. They've got no energy. It's a rotten way to live a life. However, you find in nature, if you give yourself moments of peace, moments of rest, the natural energies of your life go into the correct place, into the knowing, because the knowing is energized, the knowing is like a powerful uh, like flashlight, instead of the batteries being dull, now they're sort of recharged. What it sees, you see more of, you see richer, deeper, and of course, you enjoy it much, much more. Sometimes people think, oh, the life of the monk must be a terrible life. You can't do this and you can't do that. There's always no, no, no. You can't do this. However, in the inside, those of, you who are, those of us who are monks, you know, we have a great time. 
Why do we have a great time? Because we know just how to appreciate life. <laughs> we know how just to enhance sort of the appreciation of all the great food you give us, all the wonderful, beautiful places we live. There's very few people who've got their townhouse and their country estate. <laughs> This is my townhouse, and I've got my country estate down at Serpentine. <laughs> I remember once as a, as a young, I was a teacher at the time, and I was, that's why my friend was visiting me, and we're going down to the beach, because it was uh, almost summertime. We met, picked up these two hitchhikers. They happened to be like sadhus, disciples of Ramakrishna. They were like holy people. And they took the took us to the so-called ashram in Devon. There was this, this beautiful little house set in a valley with a running stream, meadows, beautiful trees and flowers. It was the sort of place I'd always dreamed that one day, if ever got rich, you could retire into. Paradise. I always remember that one of the men turned around to me and said something I always remember. He said, you have to give up everything to live in a beautiful place like this. I thought, isn't that right? The more you give up, the more beautiful place you live in. I mean, in the world, we think we have to work really hard to get a mansion. But if you work really hard, you can't appreciate your mansion. You're just too tired, too stressed out, too lonely to really appreciate it. But if you learn how to let go, even your small little hut in the forest becomes your mansion. Because your senses have been empowered, you can appreciate much more. You see more deeply into things. You can even see more deeply into the people you live with. Strange, isn't it, why some people are rejected by you. They're no good. They're my enemies. They need to be thrown away. Put them in prison. Throw away the key. Kill them. Exterminate them. They are pests. That's why we call the pest exterminator. Please take my husband. Remember the story of this uh, lady in the, the hairdressers talking to her friend next door, next in the next seat, saying, after I got my hair done, I'm going husband hunting. And the other goes, that's a very good idea. Here's my address. You can kill my husband while you're at it. <laughs> <laughs> the two meanings of husband hunting. <laughs> but why is it that people don't appreciate each other? A lot of time it's not because your husband or wife, the person in your office or anybody else, that there's anything wrong with them. Our senses are so dull we can't appreciate them anymore. We're dulled out to seeing the goodness in another person. In the same way that boarding house food tastes awful when you're tired. But when you've got mental energy it's beautiful. In the same way when your mind gets empowered and got energy then you can see the beauty in all people. You haven't got any enemies anymore. So you can appreciate those people. You can see their goodness. It's wonderful being a monk. Because as a monk, you can see the goodness in so many people. It's hard, actually, to actually reject anybody. In my life as a monk, I've never seen anybody who deserves to be rejected, who hasn't got some goodness in them, some beauty, some purity in them, which allows them to be my friend. Isn't that a beautiful way to live? So you just haven't got enemies. You can't see anyone who's worthy of being an enemy. You can't reject anybody. Why? Because you can see the beauty in them. Now when you're depressed and dull, because you've got no mental energy, the whole world, everybody, just is wrong, is selfish, is my enemy, I don't like them, why should I be their friends? And you've got no mental energy, you can't make a friend with anybody. With mental energy, you have such happiness that everybody is worthy to be your friend. It's not the people out there, it's just the way you look at them. The mental energy through which you look at the world. So as you start to let go more and more, as you start to make more peace, as you learn how to rest your mind, the mind becomes empowered, 
not only does your food taste more delicious, and also when your food tastes more delicious, you get less problems with your bowels. See, you get l so many benefits of coming to a Buddhist uh, center on a Friday night. Because there's so many people have irritable bowel syndrome these days. And why is that? And it is because they don't appreciate their food. Because I remember t learning this in biology at school. When you start to appreciate your food, when it's delicious, immediately you start... Look, think of your favorite food right now. Think of it. Just all those people in Singapore, your favorite noodles. Can you actually see them steaming in the bowl? You can always smell them. Can you smell them now? <laughs> it's a long way away, you know, of your favorite noodles. But nevertheless, uh, can you see the saliva come up in your mouth now? <laughs> see, because when you appreciate something, the body starts to work. Saliva starts to come out, all the juices in the gut start to come out, and then you can digest the food. If you don't like it, it may be your favorite food, but you're just too dull to really appreciate it. And you, those juices don't come out, you don't digest the food at all. So, even as this was uh, one of our monks once, he had something wrong with his bowels. He went to have one of the, I think a barrier meal it's called. They put this disgusting liquid down his throat. And it's supposed to be radioactive and they're supposed to put this x-ray on him to try and find out where it goes and see how his guts work. However, they made a big mistake of actually giving the appointment in the afternoon. And because monks don't eat in the afternoon, that bear meal just sat there. <laughs> it didn't do anything. Because, you know, for a monk, after being a monk for quite a few years, you know, your stomach learns, if it's after 12 o'clock, it rests. It doesn't do anything. So it was just sitting there. And these nurses didn't know what to do because usually, you know, things are moving all the time in a normal person. <laughs> Aren't they? <laughs> so this... So this poor Mike, the, the nur there was a nurse there, she had like a great inspiration, insight. All she said was, think of your favorite food. And as soon as he started to think of his favorite food, there it go, and all start moving again, going down here, going down there, they could actually trace what it, was, what it was doing in his bowels. It actually showed as soon as you start even thinking of your favorite food and appreciating it, then your bowels move. So now do you understand that if you start meditating here and getting a lot of happiness and joy, then you won't have irrit irritable bowel syndrome anymore. <laughs> and you <laughs> it's amazing what you learn in this Buddhist center. When you go home this evening, you say, what did Ajahn Brahm talk about? It's the irritable bowel syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> and how to agree with it. And that is Buddhism, because a Buddha taught about suffering and the end of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that what Buddhism is all about in all different ways but anyway so when you start to appreciate your food your body starts to become more healthy and sort of your life becomes more rich you get more happiness you appreciate things much more so I'm saying if you are going to a, a good restaurant meditate before you go to get your money's worth you're going to listen to a sort of a symphony orchestra sort of play Beethoven or Mahler or something to really appreciate that, meditate first of all. Let go, make your mind nice and bright. If you go there when you're really dull, if you had a really hard day at work, a hard day with your husband or wife or whatever, you can't appreciate it at all. The mind is not ready, it's not open. So I'm saying this to show you that mental energy is happiness. The more you energize that mind by resting it, by giving it some peace, by allowing it to actually to recharge its energies, the more happiness you begin to feel. The more you appreciate life, the more you appreciate the little forest in which you live, the little house in which you live, you start to lose your negativity to life. Isn't it a case that when you are negative, it's not just negative to the food you eat, it's negative to your job, negative to your house, negative to your face. You look in the mirror and think, I'm not beautiful enough if you're a girl. So you're not handsome enough if you're a boy. What does a monk think? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is, you always are negative. Where does that negativity come from? It comes from the lack of energy, the lack of happiness inside of you. Whatever you look at, whatever you do, wherever you go, ugh, yuck, boring. 
And that's what happens to many people in our life. Because that life is no fun for them. They're always escaping into alcohol, into drugs, into doing something else, always running away. They've got no happiness in the moment. Are you one of the escapees of life? Always running away from the moment, into fantasies, into dreams, anything to take me away from now. You get dull, you get depressed, you can't appreciate the finer things of life like we monks do. (laughs) Now, that energy can get even greater. The more you let go, the more the energy comes into your mind. And as you let go more and more, as you rest the mind more and more, your mind gets more energized, more happy. And that's what I always meant when I started saying that spending uh, an evening at the Buddhist center is much better than spending the evening at the brothel. You get the bliss better than sex. You get the happiness of the mind. That energy builds up and builds up. You're energized and you start to really get into the ecstasy states. But it's not just energized and ecstasy for its own sake, because with that energy you can see deeper into things. It's not just the food tastes more delicious, it's not that the leaves on the trees look more green, it's not just like the light sky twinkles much more than it should do. Your mind is energized, awake, alert, you start to see more into the nature of life. With the energized mind, you get the insights. Some of those insights are so strong, they'll make you even enlightened. From the energized mind. How on earth do you think you can actually see the truth of things when the mind is dull? And that mind is dull because it works so hard, it's got no energy left. Traditionally, in Buddhism, and becomes enlightened by stilling the mind. Sometimes people answer, how can you get enlightened by stilling the mind? Now you will know, from that stillness, from that resting of the mind, the energies start to build up. Those energies can build up so much in the mind, you get blissed out. But with that bliss, you're not sort of dull, you're energized, whatever you look at, whatever you see, whatever even you think of, if you look inside. Wow, you can see such detail of who you are. You don't want to know who you are? How on earth do you think you can see with a dull mind? It's like looking through the forest with a dull flashlight. Which is, you, know, you can hardly just see even just a, a foot in front of you, let alone see the whole forest. Why is it that we still keep getting into problems in life? Just like in a forest, just stubbing our toe on rocks, tripping over logs, always stumbling over the obstacles of our life, getting into pain, into difficulty, suffering, in all its myriad of forms. Why do we do that? Because our flashlight's not bright enough. Our mind is not strong enough to see what we're doing. Sometimes, if you ever, I remember going to these movies when I was young, and sometimes you could see like the, the. Um, uh, the hero, he was going to get into trouble. There was somebody sort of waiting behind a bush with a gun or something. And you shout out to him, hey, look out, there's someone behind the bush. You knew they were doing something stupid, but you couldn't stop them. Sometimes that's like me as a monk, seeing you do something stupid. Say, don't go that direction. There's someone with, with a gun behind the, the rock. But you can't stop them. Say, don't get angry at your husband. Don't shout at your wife. So don't get down upon what happens to you in life. Just let go. It's part of life. Leave it alone. But they still go and walk behind the rock and get shot again and again and again. Because you can't see it. The mind is not bright enough. Not enough energy. Not enough power so that insight can really see what's going on in your life. So you can avoid those obstacles. They don't need to suffer in life. Okay, something goes wrong, big deal. So that today, your wife left you, your son sort of failed his exams, you've got the sack, you just found out you've got cancer, you've only got one month to live, 
Oh, isn't that wonderful? One month to live, you've got no worries anymore. <laughs> Someone else can worry about it afterwards. So why is it that people make such a big deal of these things? So, when we have insight, we have the brightness of the mind, just we have so much insight into the nature of life that things don't worry us anymore. We actually can see beyond the suffering of life. And all those insights which you hear from uh, people sitting here, those nuggets of wisdom which you read about in the books, all of the teachings of the wise people of the past, now they are yours. You see those because your mind is energized, the energy has gone into the knowing, mindfulness is empowered, so you can actually see clearly into what needs to be done. Not only that, but for those of you who are in business, who are working, if you want to be rich, if you want to be rich beyond your wildest dreams, they give your mind energy. So you can actually see exactly what's going on. So you can be smarter than the average CEO. <laughs> or the average salesperson, or the average whatever you are. That's what happens. I must have had a natural mindfulness from the past, because I was alert. People tell me, those who went to school with me, said I was a happy boy even at school. It wasn't just happy. I was alert as well. Even when I was listening to the classes which my teachers taught, I had an incredible memory. They could actually say something, and when it came time for the examinations, not only did I remember the answer, I could recall when the teacher said that. And that's actually one of the reasons why I always sort of went, did very well through school and through university. I had a very strong memory. Why? Because I was happy, my mind was sharp, it was empowered by the happiness. I had mental energy as well as that happiness. Because out of that mental energy, my mindfulness was strong to pay full attention to what was going on. It's incredible just how dull people are. You know what the word Buddha actually means? It means awakened. Awakened one. Are you awake? <laughs> how many Buddhas are there here today? How many people are really, really awake? It's incredible that those of you who have been on meditation retreats, you just get a taste of deep meditation. You get a taste of what happens when the energies really start to go into the mind. We'll probably know just how dull we usually are. And how because of that dullness, we don't see what's really going on. We make so many mistakes. We create the suffering in our lives because of our dull and sleepiness. So how do we overcome that? You just get in there. Give your mind a break. A break. Maybe it's because I came from England, because in England we always have a tea break in the morning, a tea break in the afternoon, and any other excuse for a tea break. Now that's very civilised. <laughs> give your mind a tea break. <laughs> in other words, give it a bit of rest. Look what happens at school. If you were at school, didn't you have playtime, recess? Why do you have recess when you are at school? Because your just mind can't take all that work. You know, hour after hour after hour. So even in my monastery, when it's time for a retreat, I always say, there's a time for playtime in our monastery. If monks are getting too stressed, their meditation is not working, they're getting too dull, give yourself playtime. Say, oh, that's wasting time. It's not wasting time, it's investing time. Play. Have a little bit of fun. When you have a little bit of fun, you get happiness. With that little bit of happiness, you feel alert, alive. With that aliveness and alertness, the mind becomes empowered, you start to see things more clearly. You don't make so many mistakes. Life is not so grumpy anymore. And you become more sharp, more alert. This is actually where we find that equivalence between mental energy and happiness. When people are depressed, if you have a hard day, please, please don't fight it. 
You know that old simile which the Buddha gave, which I wrote in that book, Opening the Door of the Heart, about the demon who came into the Emperor's Palace. You, most of you know that one. If you don't know that one, I'm not going to say it today. Buy the book, which is on sale. <laughs> <laughs> That's a marketing thing today. It's on sale in the library. It's $25, but seeing as how you're all here today, especially if those people from Singapore, it's a special offer for the weekend, $24.99. <laughs> and you get it signed as well. <laughs> but when we empower the mind with happiness, then you are awake. You feel alert. Look, I should have been wiped out sort of giving this talk just now. I've had such a busy, busy, busy day. And many of you sort of have seen me in action sometimes and you have to sit up here and you've got 300 people waiting to have a nice time, come and listen to a talk. Some people come all the way from Singapore to listen to a talk. And I must admit that when I came through that door sort of an hour and a half ago, I thought... I can't give a talk tonight. I just, oh, I'm just so wiped out. I'm so tired. So when I meditated, I meditated properly. At the end of the meditation, because I let go, it's very tired to begin with. You start to feel the energies coming up. It's a great to know how to do this. You can be really, really wiped out. You just sit down for half an hour. First of all, you feel terrible. Then the energies start to come. And you start to see the mind brighten up and become sharper and sharper and then the bliss starts to come and then you know it's going to be a good talk. And that, this happened years ago when I was in Canberra giving some talks. On this particular occasion, you know what Canberra is like. Those of you coming from Singapore, don't visit Canberra. It's freezing. <laughs> and it was freezing. And of course, just after a short time, I got a terrible cold. And because I'd, people didn't, I was supposed to give all these talks. So just because I had a cold, it didn't actually stop people trying to squeeze as much out of me as they possibly could because they took me all over Canberra and then they took me to this monastery and I was there all day. And by the time I actually got to this place where I was supposed to give a talk, it was 15 minutes, hadn't showered, hadn't had a cup of tea, nothing, and had all these people waiting to listen to a talk. All I think was a, uh, someone gave me some Chinese tea, a quick Chinese tea, that was all. And I was up in front of all these people, just sneezing, coughing, the nose was running. It's very embarrassing to have a runny nose when everybody's watching you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember clearly, I just couldn't put two sentences together properly without having to sneeze. And it's terrible trying to give a talk and trying to get some continua continuation, continuity rather, trying to get a theme together, trying to make it inspiring. You know, when you've sort of got this volcano happening in your nose. <laughs> so I, I was supposed to give a talk first and then do some meditation. I said, stop, we'll do a meditation first. So 20 minutes of the most, one of the most hopeless talks I've ever given. But when I meditated... I know how to meditate. I, how do I meditate? Just let go. Just don't do anything. Don't try. And allow all the energies to start going to the mind. If the mind, if the nose wants to dribble, dribble. Doesn't matter. That's why my robes are brown, because I have to wash them so often. <laughs> so you allowed it just to happen. And, incredible. It's amazing. It's wonderful to be able to do this. After half an hour of meditating, the mind was energized. And the nose had stopped running. The, the cold was you know, just way over there somewhere. And I was a long way away from it inside. And you could give this really nice talk. And I remember the person who was taking me around. I said, did you notice anything? I said, yeah, I saw that you were terrible before you meditated. You looked terrible too, but afterwards you gave this wonderful talk. Now that's how I work. That's how you can work. If you know how to energize the mind... It's amazing how successful you can be in your career. Whether it's a monk career, whether it's uh, sales, whether it's just being a, a, a family person, a father, whatever you do in your life, energize the mind through learning how to be still. Not only that, you can be a very successful 
in your spiritual life as well. You know the secret of inner happiness. You know the secret of, of wisdom, seeing clearly and deeply into the nature of things and also appreciating things as well. This is a panacea, this snake oil which gives you everything you ever wanted in your whole life. Both success in life, both this appreciation of the richness of life, the deep insights into the nature of things, and enlightenment itself. According to the teachings of the Buddha, this, he said, is a path without groaning. If you're, this is actually one of the sayings of the Buddha. This path, this eightfold path, is a path without groaning. If you're groaning, you're not practicing properly. You're not, you've forgotten the words of the Buddha, the path of the Buddha. This is a path not of complaining, of groaning, but a path of greater acceptance, greater happiness. Not, but wow. Not, I have to get up in the morning, but wow, another day. zippity doo another day. All of you people from Singapore, you've paid so much money for come over here to Perth. Wow, what a wonderful day. When you wake up tomorrow morning, don't look at the clock, get out of bed, jump out. Get your money's worth of this trip. <laughs> now you start putting energy into the mind, energy into life. Your breakfast, I will guarantee, will taste even more delicious than you did expect. And when you go to see the sights, oh, they'll be just so much more enjoyable. And when you go and have your dinner, don't forget to meditate for half an hour beforehand. Mmm, that's delicious. You really know how to appreciate life. And you get so empowered, so full of energy. Whatever you do in life, you'll be able to succeed in. And you'll be someone who's attractive, because who likes grumpy people? Do you like grumpy people? Are you married to a sourpuss? <laughs> if you are, no need to divorce them, take them to the next meditation retreat and I will turn your sourpuss in nine days into this happy, wonderful, energized, lovely person. <laughs> it's like on the TV advertising, isn't it? <laughs> but it happens, this is true. Because mental energy is happiness. And mental energy comes from being still. If you learn to be still from time to time, you will never get depressed, fed up, or grumpy ever again. You'll be a person who doesn't get angry. Anger comes from depression, fed up with somebody or with the world. You'll overcome those things. And you'll be able to appreciate life more and more. The path of enlightenment is a path of ever-increasing happiness. Ever-increasing appreciation of the world and its people ever-increasing friendliness, compassion, freedom. That's the path of enlightenment. So the more happy you are, the inner happiness, I don't mean the outer happiness, the more you're treading on the path of the Buddha, the path without groaning, the path of ending suffering and arising happiness until one day you get the ultimate happiness, the paramang sukhang, which the Buddha said was enlightenment. Make your mind still and it gets happier and happier, richer and richer, deeper and deeper, so it gets the happiness of the Supreme Enlightenment. May that be yours. Thank you. Now, you know what I say, if you're going to do something, do it properly. If you're going to clap, clap with everything you've got. Go on. <laughs> If you're going to shout, boo, sh shout whatever you've got, boo. <laughs> okay, so that's the talk this evening. Now, are there any questions, comments or complaints? Um, mental energy equals happiness. How to overcome depression, how to enjoy your meal, and how to overcome irritable bowel syndrome. <laughs> any questions? Yeah, we go. What well, question in the front? Yeah. Yeah, they say irritable, irritable bowel, just in brief, comes from constipated mind. 
Yeah, well, that's true. It also comes from irritable mind as well. If you have an irritable mind, easily irritated. Why? This is one of the sayings in that little book. And actually, I think I mentioned to you that our premier here, uh, Jeff Gallup, wrote back to me and said that's the one thing he really appreciated when I told him that, I think in the book it said, why allow other people to control your happiness? And he wrote back and said, that's very good. Now I will never allow the media to control my happiness. (laughs) No matter what they say about me, I'm going to be happy no matter. So that's true. I mean, why allow life to control your happiness? Why be irritated? What's the point of being irritated? You have got a choice. You can allow life to irritate you if you want. You can say, no, I'm going to rebel. Life, I will refuse to be irritated by you. If it's a hot day, I'm going to think, what a wonderful day it is. It's hot because I've got a cool head. So you're not irritated by it. And if it's very, very cold, especially some of you Singaporeans used to hot Singapore, sometimes the weather does change it. Sometimes it gets very cold. If it's very cold, you say, that's fine, I'm not going to be irritated by the cold because I'm going to have a warm heart. When it's cold, make sure you have a warm heart. When it's hot, make sure you have a cool head. And that way, you're never irritated. (laughs) So why be irritated in your life? You're just creating suffering for yourself. You're saying, life hurt me. The dog barks. You think, that stupid dog, why did he bark to say, when I'm meditating? And I say, oh dog, thank you for teaching me the Dhamma. I can't control that dog out there. There you go, thank you. (laughs) That's what you should do when your husband barks at you. (laughs) Or when your kids start to sort of get, sort of, you know, really... Not naughty. Well, they're kids. What do you expect? Look, you had those kids. So why are you complaining? You should have become a monk or a nun if you didn't want kids. <laughs> but why allow life to irritate you? You don't have to. So when you've got an irritable mind, you have an irritable bowel, and you have a very irritating mouth, when you start, <laughs> start to say rotten things about others. So... Never allow the world to control your happiness. Be like a Buddha. Doesn't matter what people say about him. Doesn't matter if he's sick, healthy. Doesn't matter what happens in the world. He'll be happy no matter what. Why not? Makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, very nice. That's right, UM, Unconditional Mindfulness. That's very good. That's the acronym for unconditional mindfulness. Um. <laughs> very smart. Very good. You see, you're happy. Because of happiness, your mind has been energized. Because of that energized, you've had this wonderful insight that unconditional mindfulness equals um. See, it works. <laughs> see, you woke up. Very good. Okay, I think that's enough for tonight because it's nine o'clock. And now's the time for announcements. So, please don't go for the door yet. (laughs) There are some important announcements coming your way.